Hi everyone, uh, I hope this is working. Hi everyone, uh, I think it is working now. Um, if you're tuning in, welcome. Uh, I think you can hear me. The lighting in this video is uh, going to be a little weird. Uh, there are going to be times where it looks like I might be kind of dark, but it is really bright in here. Um, unfortunately, for you guys to be able to see everything, most of the light is going to be behind me. Um, I'm surrounded here uh, by windows and spiders. So, hi Carl. Nice to see you here. Um, so during this video, I'm going to be going over uh, three main aspects of keeping jumping spiders, uh, particularly uh, FIDS, uh, which is the most common uh, family of jumping spiders to keep. That includes uh, your regal jumping spiders, your bold jumping spiders, uh, the carneus, the o oticius, or <laughs> however you say it. Uh, you'll have to forgive me. I see a lot of these Latin names. Um, but most of us in the hobby will tell you that we rarely get to uh, hear them. So, uh, hi Nikki, thanks for joining us. Um, so, I'm going to go over, uh, first I'm going to go over housing your jumping spider, like what kind of environment they need. And then next I'm going to talk about uh, feeding your spider, uh, what kind of prey, prey items are appropriate, um, some tips on how to give those feed those feeders to your spider. Um, and then in the final section, I'm going to kind of talk about the different life stages uh, of jumping spiders. Um, I get a lot of questions a lot uh, about uh, my spider has been in its hammock for a week or more and it's not eating and it's not drinking. Uh, I get it. I get it. Um, I've been where all of you are at some point. Um, I have grown a lot, I've learned a lot, I've developed a really good system <clears throat> that works for me. Uh, I've been breeding these jumping spiders for about two years um, and I want everyone to be successful at this and I want it to be easy and fun uh, for everyone, people, and spiders. Uh, so I have uh, a plan to kind of address uh, my usual questions. I since I've uh, started selling the spiders, I get a lot of the same questions. So if you were here because I directed you to come here in an email, thank you for coming and listening. Uh, these are just their questions everyone has, uh, especially beginners. Uh, we all have to start somewhere. Uh, but I am just one person with a, a lot of bugs that I'm taking care of. So bear with me. Um, so let's, without much further ado, let's get started and talk about housing. <clears throat> so with housing, uh, we always think that these are wild animals and they live out in nature and they need all this room. Uh, with jumpers, that's really only true in that they need a larger area to hunt. However, uh, when their food is basically served to them at their leisure, they don't really need a large space. Um, in fact, if you have a smaller spider, that can actually make it more difficult uh, for them to find their food and for you to find them. Uh, so, because they, they're good little hiders. Uh, so, with your enclosure, uh, I, I've made up some of these. So, this is a, a small one. This is one I would recommend for um, a sling or a small juvenile. Um, I like to use the rule of thumb, like you want the container to be about as wide as the spider can jump. So that will help you kind of apply it to different species. Uh, I would definitely say, you know, know your species. Um, most care is going to be general uh, across the line, but there are some preferences and some specifications um, within, you know, where they're native to. Um, so I'm making up a few of these. I found um, some of these containers. So I've, I drill all these holes by hand with a very tiny drill bit. So this is very important. Uh, I encourage you if you're crafty, like make your own enclosures, make them really cool. Uh, you can do kind of an artificial environment um, or a more natural environment, uh, just depending on your taste. Uh, I don't know where you're from 
if you have a lot of wild jumping spiders, but you'll most often find them in your windowsill. So they really don't mind glass and plastic and they like hanging out in corners. Uh, I actually got these skulls and I cut them in half and then I cut a little hole. And uh, I like this because then I can see when they're in there. Um, also like a little flower or silk leaf or something like that uh, glued up in the, in the top corner. Uh, that's one of their favorite hiding spots and they like to get into the little petals and like they'll sew it up into a little hammy and peek out at you. It's pretty cute. Um, you know, some anchor points for them to jump, jump on things. Um, the ventilation, make sure that you have cross ventilation. That means opposite sides are drilled. Uh, and I like one on the top as well because the more airflow you have, the better, uh, really. Uh, make, make sure that not too much humidity is, is building up in your container, but that you're also keeping enough. And that's that can be kind of a tricky line uh, for people to find. Um, so this is a small one. Uh, this is the next size up. And what I'm going to do uh, is I have a couple people that have requested these, and then I'll get some more made up, and I will list them on my Facebook and Instagram page. It'll just be kind of first come, first serve. Uh, unfortunately, these particular containers I've had issues getting, so they're limited stock. So as you can see, this one's a, a little bit bigger, um, and I did the same drill pattern, the little flowers, I did my little skull hide. Uh, so this one has just aquarium gravel on the bottom. Uh, this has a few benefits uh, to it. One is that it's heavy, so you know it, it really gives some weight to your enclosure. That being said, make sure you always pick it up by the bottom and not by the top. Um, you don't want to get halfway to where you're going and the bottom fall out because it's bottom heavy. <laughs> but it does give it a nice center of gravity. Um, it looks pretty. You can get it in just about any color. Uh, you know, anything that's going to be safe for an aquarium is for sure going to be safe for your jumping spider enclosure. Uh, most things are. They don't eat anything besides bugs. Um, I would say rule of thumb, if it smells like chemicals, I wouldn't use it uh, because they are... Um, a little bit more susceptible uh, to environmental uh, things. So that being said, uh, you know, watch essential oils and things like that about your invertebrates. If you're totally new to invertebrates, um, you know, it has been in, like air fresheners, incense, uh, those oil burners, uh, anything that's going to put uh, essential oils and toxins into the air can actually not <laughs> be good. They, they, they don't have the ability to filter the air like we do. Uh, so that's important. Uh, so moving moving back to enclosures uh, and air. Air quality is important. Um, so we'll get back to feeding and watering in a minute because it does tie into the overall humidity. I'm just looking for a good enclosure to show you. I'm going to reach up here <laughs> okay, so these are what I keep my adult uh, fids in. And this container here is about 4 by 4 by 7 inches. Uh, there are many similar designs online. Uh, you could probably go a little bigger. Uh, this guy, as you can tell, um, this is one of my uh, dads to be here, Ferdinand. Um, this uh, clutch is named after the Spanish dynasty because they're regal jumping spiders and I thought it was funny. Um, but as you can see he's got little twigs and branches to hang out on and this is one of my more natural uh, environments and um, because the regal jumping spiders uh, are down south and around Florida uh, they like it a little bit warm and they like it a little bit humid. Um, I've got some gravel in the bottom to add a little bit of weight and drainage and then cocoa fiber and then some moss. So um, you can see there's just a tiny bit of condensation on here and that is about all I want to see when I set him in this window. Now please note this window is not direct sunlight. The direct sunlight uh, comes from this window behind me in the morning and this one over to my side uh, later in the day. So they get kind of indirect sunlight and they do like, like to have sun. Um, if windows aren't an option for you, uh, 
you can get like a little desk lamp. I think I have them all tucked away, but you know, just a little desk lamp, regular light bulb. Uh, keep an eye on it, make sure you, it doesn't get too close to the enclosure and heat it up. It will kind of have like a little greenhouse effect. Um, you know, you want to make sure there's not too much condensation <clears throat> on the side of the container. It is uh, pretty easy for them to drown if it gets too humid. Uh, they have like book lungs. Um, it's really, <laughs> unless you're familiar with uh, bug anatomy, it's totally different <laughs> from any kind of human anatomy. Uh, so uh, you just kind of have to think about things in a, in a different way. Um, so that being said, I put moss in the enclosure. Uh, well, with my little bitty baby spiders, let me see if I can find one. Oh, this one's going to a new home tomorrow. We've got to feed all, all these back here. So this is a little regal jumping spider baby. Actually, this is a pretty big baby, almost a juvenile, believe it or not. They start out way smaller than that. And as you can see, I've got a two ounce deli cut, lots of holes all the way around. Um, these are a little bit more milky than I like. I like really clear cuts uh, so I can see them. Uh, but I ordered, I, I could not see the box. And I have 2,000 of these and I just use them as shipping cups. But the good, so, the good news is, is the lid is pretty clear. So I just keep them up because I have to stack so many. This is probably not a problem for most people. Uh, but this is a good cheap alternative to keep your sling in and I keep them in here until they're about big enough to take a blue bottle fly spike and then I'll move them up to the next size cup which is a four ounce cup and this one actually has two even tinier slings in it um, when you're raising thousands of spiders uh, it is much easier to keep them all together uh, as long as you can uh, before things go south. That being said, no jumping spiders cannot be kept communally. Um, they're a, a one spider per, per tank kind of deal, uh, you know, after, after a certain instar, which I don't sell spiders that are small enough <laughs> for you to keep together. So all the ones I'm selling are old enough that I've separated them out. And speaking of which, I'll go ahead and take you through my little spider nursery because I, I assume some of you are here to see baby spiders. And we've got some growing nicely in here. I just fed them yesterday, so there's a lot of fruit flies. But there's a fat one hanging out, if you can see it. Um, and I'll kind of pull them out as they start to get bigger. Um, I'm trying to think of where my newest clutch is over here. I fed everybody yesterday. There they are. The carnage of all the dead flies. That little speck and that little speck. There's a bunch, all the little specks. Um, so as you can see, I, I have to grow them for quite a while. Um, those are probably second in star. Um, I have several more moms. Uh, for those of you that I know have been anxiously awaiting uh, the Regis. Oop, here she is. So this is my ingenious breeding cup system. For those of you that have babies, I happen to find uh, containers um, that have cups that fit over them. So after the eggs hatch, uh, there's no way that you can see this, but there's a bunch of little babies I can see in the web. Uh, and when it gets to that point, I will actually flip the container up on its side and take this cup to the top to uh, create uh, this extra space. And mom likes to hang out and sun. Uh, this cup has extra tiny ear holes in it that I poke with like a needle instead of doing them with a Dremel. Um, because the Regal babies, they can uh, get out of a Dremel sized hole, at least with the bits that I have. Um, so as you can see, if you end up with a gravid jumping spider and you see little black specks in there, you're about to have a lot of babies come out. Uh, so if you're worried about them getting out of the air holes, um, since I put a, so many air holes in these containers, I went ahead and just put pantyhose over the entire container. Uh, I can still see in the air. Air can get out. Um, I personally also have an issue with ants, uh, so I like anything that's ant proof. So the ants also uh, cannot get through the pantyhose. So pro tip, pantyhose. 
If you have just like a small area or a strip, you can also uh, tape a uh, screen over it. So I've actually got five moms up here right now, all uh, waiting on those babies to come out. And three more, we're still waiting on eggs to hatch. So uh, we will have plenty of uh, regals in the future. Um, so most of the jumping spiders are arboreal. Uh, so you're gonna want a tall container for your spider to live in, uh, most species. They will almost always hang out at the top. So it's not really a good idea to have a container that opens at the top with like a lid at the top. Um, this, these containers are actually supposed to go like this. And there are other companies that make enclosures like these and the small parts at the top. But uh, I really like this. It makes it really easy to clean and feed and find your spiders since they're always at the top. You can just set the bottom down and not mess up their web or potentially squish them, which is a terrible thought, I know, for all of us. Um, so definitely get something with a door that opens in the front or the container opens in the middle or you're going to have a bad time. Um, that being said, you know, you can also use like a pretzel container or where is this? I keep mantids in these now um, because I have a bug problem um, and the good kind, I suppose. So like these kind of containers as well, they're like three or four bucks at Walmart. Uh, really, they were super easy to drill, drill through with a dremel bit, um, you know, and you can set them on the side. Uh, you know, they don't really need substrate. Uh, people ask about substrate. Uh, I want to say that I do have a lot of tarantulas and I have more jumping spiders and the care is very different uh, for the two. Uh, I, would, I, I would say that the, the jumpers are probably more like taking care of mantids. So there are benefits and con you know, pros and cons to different, different types of uh, substrate. The gravel is easy to clean. It looks pretty. Uh, there's never really any reason that most jumping spiders should be on the ground. Um, so I like to put the sphangum moss at the bottom. It helps keep the humidity up. It, um, it also gives them something to drink off of. Uh, you know, you want to very lightly mist the container or mist something at the bottom like moss or paper towels. Um, I like paper towels, and you'll notice I keep them in the cups uh, for a few reasons. One, they're cheap, they're easy, uh, they're white, and the spider is black, and when you're looking for a tiny speck, it's nice to have uh, some contrast. Uh, you know, I can even hold it up to the light and see if the spider is in, in the folds of the paper towel, which is something else I do when I put the paper towel into the cup is I kind of fold it up a bit to make all these little like nooks and crannies and cavities um, because they like to hide in things. <laughs> They'll find a little hole and hide in it and make their little handy in there. So uh, this one will be cleaned soon. <laughs> it ate a bunch of flies. I'll put that one back. So I'm a big proponent of paper towels. Uh, some people will use cotton balls. Uh, also the white paper towel or cotton ball will um, give you uh, contrast to see any kind of mold or bad stuff growing on it. So you can just throw it out and replace it pretty easily. Um, so moving on to feeding and watering because that ties into the humidity and all of the decor stuff. Um, so that, this is a tr tricky question to, to answer. How, how often should I water my spider? So that depends on the spider that the, the environment that, the, that you're keeping the spider in. Um, so here I have a whole room and currently it is 90 degrees uh, and about 60% humidity. Uh, the sun's hitting us right now. It's probably not that hot in the entire room, uh, but I keep my thermostat in the hottest area um, just so I can know where my top is. Uh, and I'm running two humidifiers in here, so I try and keep my overall humidity in this room kind of high. Uh, you can also keep them in a cabinet 
or like a tote, make that double barrier uh, to help keep them um, more humid. Uh, that's not really necessary with jumpers. They are a great desk pet. Um, and they don't have very high humidity needs. The lower, the lower your humidity, so if you live somewhere where it's a really dry climate, I would say you're probably going to have to water a little bit more often, uh, especially if you have a species like the uh, regals. Um, now, if you're somewhere where it's more humid, you may only have to water your spider once a week. Um, so it's just going to, I would say, that's the other reason I like the paper towel, is whenever the paper towel starts getting, you know, feel the paper towel, and if it feels dry and crispy, then it's definitely time uh, to water your spider. Uh, the Spanga moss works similarly. Uh, when it dries out, you can you can definitely feel the difference. So uh, just miss the bottom of the enclosure a little, and you should be good to go for several days. Um, now, <laughs> feeding your jumping spider. Uh, no, you cannot feed your jumping spider too much. Yes, they will will eat and eat and eat, uh, <laughs> especially the carneus. Uh, and slings, they're growing a lot. Um, man, then I have one over here. I've got, I mean, they're fat as ticks over here. I, I fed uh, the group cup babies a whole, a whole lot of flies. I always have to keep the little, little babies really well fed to keep them together. Um, and so they'll get really plump, uh, and then they'll go get in their little handy, and they'll change clothes real quick, and they'll come out bigger. Uh, <laughs> So as the spider grows, like each molt will take a little bit longer and each molt depends on the spider and the conditions, you know, the light, the humidity, the temperature. Uh, so it's really hard to give a definitive answer like how long does it take a spider to molt. Um, it really is a case by case basis and they may not be molting in there the entire time. Some of them really just like to hang out in their hammocks. Uh, for a while, and I mean, it could, it could be a week, uh, 10 days, uh, especially if you're talking about the last couple of molts uh, reaching adulthood. Uh, I think there's a lot of changes that are probably going on with them. Um, so uh, definitely be patient. Uh, keep lightly misting the container. Keep offering food. Uh, of course, you can take out um, any uneaten prey items. So that brings us uh, more into feeding, uh, which variety is the spice of life. So there are a long list of things that you can feed jumping spiders. Uh, basically anything that's not going to eat them back. Um, and that has to do with like the appropriate size. So like these little, whoop, I knocked them over. That's okay. That's what the paper towel is for. Uh, it's pretty securely webbed in here. So uh, these guys right here are my smaller slings. Um, first few instars, I'm feeding these small, what do they call them, the flightless fruit, fruit, fruit flies. That's hard for me to say. Um, I've got a culture just brimming with them here. Uh, you can see they're pretty tiny. And this is this is pretty small for a fruit fly even. <laughs> and then after that, I go to the big fruit flies. So, um, you, know, you know, especially with the small slings, I don't really want to go prey, go for prey that's too much bigger than they are. Um, especially with the regals. Um, ooh, there's a lot of flies in there. Uh, so these are the Hydei. So, I know what you're thinking. Um, I'm going to open this cup and the flies are just going to be all over my house. Um, I, ideally, uh, you want to avoid that. So if you are ordering flies from me, I have a bait fridge. I'm, I've got a lot of, a lot of feeders. I, <laughs> I had to get a fridge. Uh, so if you're ordering flies from me, you're getting them in one of these handy dandy flip top containers. Uh, so there will be a bunch of flies in here and when you get ready to feed, what you can do is you put this container in the refrigerator uh, for a little while, 10 minutes at least, uh, I would say, and then they'll kind of go to sleep. And if you are getting your fruit flies elsewhere, you can also clean out like an old uh, pepper container 
and reuse it. I like these because they're one-handed and I have to feed many, many spiders. So I can open it and close it with one hand and deal with the spider and the container with the other hand uh, because when you have baby spiders running everywhere and fruit flies running everywhere, it can be very stressful. <laughs> uh, so I find that the, the spice uh, bottles really help slow down so you're not dumping like a million flies in there all at once, uh, which happens pretty easily, especially when you um, put them in that sleep state by putting them in the fridge. Uh, so refrigerate flies um, to slow them down. It puts them in sleep, it kind of like a little sleep state. Now I will say the warmer it is, the faster they get moving again. Uh, so work quickly or work near a fridge, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'll have to go back. I was having to go back and forth uh, to keep the flies in the fridge and then pull them out. So after uh, they graduate from these guys, um, the next step is blue bottles. Let me see here. All right, here's a container. All right. So there are three stages. If you are ordering flies for me or you order a large enough um, spider for me, I pack their little lunches when I ship them. And I'm a big fan of blue bottle fly spikes. Um, that is the not gross term for maggots. Um, we like to call them spider burritos. They are tasty. The spiders love them. I just pulled these guys out of my fridge. Um, they like to be kept pretty cold. Uh, you can see they're starting to kind of wiggle around now. Um, I think they're pretty gross, but the spiders think they're pretty delicious. They're a great source of protein, and this is my standard feeder um, for juveniles all the way up to adults because I can do many things with these. So if they're hungry, um, I can give them one of these guys. They're not intimidating, so even the smaller spiders will take them. Um, they won't hurt my spiders. If they don't eat them, then we go to the next step, which are these little uh, brown things. You can see there's a fly hatched in there, but they will uh, pupae right up. Uh, and then in a few days, they will hatch into a crunchy and juicy fly. Uh, so that gives me kind of uh, three different feeders. Uh, and if I don't, uh, I have a lot of spiders to feed, and if I want to do anything other than feed spiders, I, uh, I've learned to pack their lunch, so I will give them extra uh, flies, put some pupae in there, so they have flies today, and then in two or three days, uh, the blue bottles will hatch out. Depending on the temperature and all that, um, blue bottles take about seven, seven days or so. Uh, now, those of you that like to watch murder shows should know that, <laughs> that they can use uh, the flies, uh, insects, to um, tell you how long a dead body's been outside. Um, but in order to do that, they have to look at the weather conditions because that is ultimately what affects how quickly that cycle happens. So the warmer it is, uh, the faster you're going to get the flies to cycle. The colder it is, the longer it takes. Uh, that being said, it's another great way to take advantage of blue bottle flies. Um, they easily last a month in the fridge and you can kind of time out, like pull some out, hatch them out, feed them. Um, the flies themselves last longer in the fridge. Like at all stages, you can, you can store them in the fridge and get a longer lifespan out of them. Um, another one of my favorite feeders uh, are wax worms. And I have them in this cup right now because uh, like the flies, I like that I get different stages of feeders. More bang for your buck, right? So wax worms are fat, I'm trying to catch one here, <laughs> are fat, juicy, little white worms. Seems squiggling around there. Uh, these guys are pretty high in fat, so um, you don't want to feed them uh, like every day, like regular. <laughs> But they are a nice treat and they're juicy um, and they won't hurt your spiders and like if they don't eat them 
Then they pupate as well, and your spider can eat that. And if they don't, it's going to hatch into a tasty moth. And uh, jumping spiders are sight predators, so they will eat anything that flies, hops, or crawls. Um, crickets, uh, appropriate sized crickets, uh, are a good feeder uh, because most people have them available at local pet stores or bait shops. I would say make sure um, you know you're getting them from a reliable source, but most importantly, uh, you get size appropriate or maybe even smaller crickets than you need. Uh, crickets, uh, mealworms, superworms, uh, they all have mouth parts and can bite your spider back. So if you're worried about that with like the superworms or the mealworms, uh, you can like crush their little heads uh, <laughs> before you offer it to your spider. Uh, the worm will still flop around and still be interesting to the spider. Uh, spiders will not, uh, jumping spiders will not eat uh, pre-killed prey. Uh, unless it's moving, they don't, they're not, it's not even on their radar. Uh, so definitely um, make sure that the prey is moving and alive. Uh, that being said, uh, on occasions, uh, some of these spiders will have a sweet tooth. So uh, you can offer fresh fruit uh, like peaches or grapes or watermelon, something juicy, uh, honey on like a Q-tip. Some of them do have a bit of a sweet tooth. Again, it's an individual preference. It's not necessary, but uh, I know a lot of people like to spoil their pets. So, uh, you know, variety. Um, do be roaches. Uh, they come in a variety of sizes. They're also harmless. Um, I like them because they're kind of slow and they don't have wings or look anything like a cockroach. Uh, if you're a roach person, uh, red runners, like really there's a wide, wide variety. Like if you can, if you can feed it to your reptile uh, or your tarantulas, you can probably uh, feed it to your jumping spider, assuming it's size appropriate. Um, so that should cover everything I think I can think of on feeding. Uh, how often should you feed your jumping spider, maybe? Uh, so that depends on the age. The younger they are, the more often they eat um, because they're also eating smaller prey. Um, so if your spider is growing and you're still feeding it fruit flies and it just doesn't seem to get full, it may be time to switch to a larger prey. Um, sometimes they will stop eating like right when they're getting ready to molt. Uh, you know, so give them a couple of days, wait for them to come out again. Uh, I usually know when my spiders are hungry, like you see this, uh, this regal uh, girl up here, maybe not. Uh, yep, yeah. she's out. Um, even though I already fed her a fly, she's out looking for another fly. Uh, I know she's hungry because she has babies and she's out of her nest. So, uh, even if the eggs aren't fertile, a lot of times the uh, females will uh, hole up in there for quite some time. Um, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about eggs here in a minute. Um, that being said, be very careful where you get your uh, female spiders from. If you have an adult female wild caught jumping spider, yes, it is gravid. I can almost assure you that is a winning bet. That spider <laughs> is going to have babies. So uh, it's cool. Make sure you're prepared. It's not that difficult. Um, it's been a very fun experience. Let me get a drink. <laughs> Mm. I offer a, a wide variety of feeders. I'm going to try and keep them in stock. Um, if you have trouble getting feeders, I also want to throw this out there. So I got these on Amazon, and they are fruit fly traps. Uh, I think a pair of them was like, I don't know, like 10 bucks or something. I, I'm not going to open it because there's actually fruit flies in here right now. But it's got a tiny hole in the top and the flies fly in there and they can't get out. And you can just put like a little piece of fruit or something in there. Uh, it works pretty pretty well. Um, it enables me to trap fruit flies, especially when I'm having a hard time finding them, um, you know, in stock anywhere uh, or my cultures. I'm, I'm really bad about scheduling cultures. Um, so 
these are really great. Uh, now, wild caught prey. So, obviously, with the amount of insects that I have around here, um, most of the flies and insects that I'm catching around my house for my bugs are escaped feeders anyway. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it it is usually okay for you to feed your spider um, things that, that you catch. Um, that being said, I would steer away from like wild caught crickets or things on the ground. Uh, I mean this more like flying things like moths or, you know, house flies. Um, you know, you're going to run the risk of a parasite, but, you know, uh, I hate to say it, but from, you know, you're going to run that risk from store-bought prey as well. I mean, uh, it's just part of bug life. Um, what you're going to worry most about from wild caught prey is going to be like pesticides and things like that. Obviously here we are 100% like no chemical uh, anything. I, I don't want to risk uh, anything happening. Um, I'm always looking for alternative ways to deal with my ant problem, uh, for instance. So it's a it's been a long battle, but I'm winning it. So be very mindful of like what your prey items may have come in contact with, like if you're spraying bug spray or, uh, you know, anything they may have gotten into. All right, so let's talk about life stages. Whoop. All right, so this lady, uh, some of you may be getting uh, some of her babies. I mean, I think this is like her third or fourth clutch. She, uh, I just moved her into this container, um, from her old container because there were so many, um, old nests in there. Uh, <laughs> she's, uh, she can see she's got it webbed up pretty well. So this is, a uh, this is Luna. Uh, she's being a good mommy. You see her on her egg sacs in there. Um, <clears throat> so I know her eggs are fertile for a variety of reasons. One, uh, she has had, uh, several clutches already that have hatched and some of them, um, are almost grown. Two, let me see if I can get her back lit here. Uh, this way. I don't know if you can tell in my crappy camera here, but the eggs are pretty yellow. Um, if these eggs were not fertile, they would be like, they would like dry up and be kind of brown. And you can see they're kind of yellow and plump. Um, so that is a good indication that you have a fertile sac. Uh, once a spot, once a female spider mates, uh, she's fertile forever. So every egg sac she lays, uh, will, will be fertile. I don't know if you can see her. I want to turn her around. She's so pretty. Um, but once they lay their egg sac, they will be on there, uh, for quite some time. That's another reason I really like, uh, the fly spikes as a food source is I'm able to get in here with tweezers and I can set it just outside and I offer website uh, <laughs> delivery for my new moms because they are hesitant to come out. Now even if you have an adult female spider um, that was captive bred and has never seen a male, she probably will lay an egg sac. Um, she will make a nest and she will lay an egg sac because uh, that's just what they do in nature. Uh, if they actually if they don't, they can actually uh, become egg bound and that is fatal. So one of the downsides to getting a female spider is that they are going to spend a considerable amount of their adult life uh, hanging out in their, in, their, in their web, in their nest. Uh, the males are definitely out more. Um, they may not come in the, the color variety of the girls, but uh, I don't know if you're distracted like me and you've been watching them crawl around up here. These are my, my boy regals and they've been, they're out every day. Uh, they don't even really make that much of an effort uh, to build that nice of a, a hammock. They just kind of string a couple strings together. Like that's good enough. Um, so definitely uh, it is totally normal for your spider to be webbed up in a hammy for an extended period of time. And you probably see me looking around because I'm looking for one that I can use as a good example. And I have so many. I'm trying to see who's molted lately. Uh, 
Oh yeah. Okay. So this is one that just came out not too long ago. Uh, it looks fat because it's been uh, working on this fly spike for quite some time. This is a little um, juvenile Onyx. And it's in a four ounce cup. And you notice to keep the cup upside down because look where its little hammy is. Let's see if I can get the glare out. The little hammy is right here. And you can see where it just molted. A little dark spots of the malt. So uh, the malt can look a lot like your spider. Uh, so if you see the hammy and it looks like your spider is dead in it, make sure you check the rest of the container very, very well because there's a good chance it's just the malt, just the old skin. Um, Audix's um, and the Carneus are, um, they're very, very hungry little hippos. Uh, they are not afraid to take down prey uh, twice their size, um, and it is fun to watch. So I think this is a little juvenile girl. She's still got all the orange spots. So the it'll look just like a little cocoon, um, and it really depends on the species. And I I find more individual spiders. Um, maybe some are just lazier than others. Uh, <laughs> make a, a nicer. Uh, malt hammock um, than, than others. So uh, they'll have a little hammy to sleep in um, and then they'll, they'll malt um, and then, you, you know, move. So I, there's just, I wish I could give a definite answer. Like at this point you should start worrying. Um, so if you are worried about your spider, let me introduce you to some of my favorite tools of the trade. So this is the brush that I use uh, when I go through every week and I clean out their little containers. Uh, I knock all the stuff off. This brush is big and it's really soft. Um, so if, there, if I do accidentally brush over a spider, there's no damage. Um, this one is uh, smaller but a little, little bit more stiff, which is good when I'm trying to clean out <laughs> little areas. This this is my coveted baby spider brush. Um, it is a Sumi uh, ink brush with a natural um, hair head. And the bristles are really long and really fine and they stick to webbing really well. And I find that it almost just kind of scoops the little baby up. I mean, tiny one, two, and star slings. I can move with this. Um, so I highly recommend a very soft, very soft, and that's the key, soft bristled paintbrush uh, to move your slings with uh, because they are so teeny tiny and delicate. Uh, so I just come up with this. So this is spy this paintbrush has moved many of spiders. And if you've got a spider for me, it has had its bottom brush with this paintbrush. <laughs> so at some point. Uh, <sighs> That's one of the things that's scary is like how tiny they are. Uh, so they start out pretty tiny and then I don't even, I, to be honest, I have not been able to keep a really good count on how many molts it takes uh, for them to get to adulthood uh, because of the sheer mass numbers. Uh, so each egg sac will contain anywhere from one to like 300 babies. We're talking a lot of spider babies, um, so I, I have to start out, um, you know, keeping them in, in the groups and then dividing them up. Uh, so because I keep them in groups in the really early instars, it's hard for me to gauge exactly which mole everyone's on. Uh, my very first clutch of babies, I separated them all out because I was just terrified they were going to immediately start eating each other. Um, and they were much more difficult to take care of. Uh, you have to take care of them a lot more often in the smaller two ounce cups, the little babies. Uh, they'll dry out faster uh, and the humidity is really, really crucial uh, to keep steady the first few days um, after they hatch. So um, I, <laughs> I keep them together and it's harder to track exactly which mole everyone's on. Uh, I have gotten a label maker and I've gotten a lot better about tracking, you know, whose babies are whose. Um, I'm really bad about putting the dates on stuff. So I know people will ask me, uh, you know, how old is, is my spider? And I can't really give you a good 
a good uh, date for a couple of reasons. One, I'm, I just mentioned I'm terrible at it. And two, uh, so Luna's babies here um, are actually probably at, at their first and start are pretty close. Like those are what we call eggs with legs. <laughs> uh, you know, their first molt happens in here. Um, and after after that, it's still a while before they even leave the nest. Um, the five moms I have up here, I can see the little slings in there. They're black. I see them moving around. They'll actually molt again uh, before they before they leave the nest. Um, and then at that point, I'll put them in the group cups until uh, they start getting big enough um, to go to new homes. Um, and at that point, they're probably at least big enough to take the Heidi eye. Uh, the Regal saw out really uh, quickly, um, which is kind of cool because uh, the Regals, well, really all jumping spiders uh, will change a lot with each molt. So it's really neat to see the different stages, the colors and patterns change and whatnot. Uh, jumping spiders will live anywhere from one to three years. Um, so the male lifespan can be a tad bit shorter than the female, but like I said, he's going to spend his entire life like out <laughs> and uh, she's going to spend a good chunk of hers uh, locked in a nest. So I guess it just depends on quality versus quantity uh, if you're considering whether or not you want a male or female uh, as a pet. So uh, the males can be smaller uh, and can have a, a tad bit shorter lifespan, uh, but they're out more and they tend to be like a little bit more outgoing. Um, so a lot of spiders have a, their own distinct personality, um, but as far as species goes, I kind of came into these carnias by accident and um, as you can tell, I have a ton of uh, regals, I have a ton of audix. Uh, I have a lot of high lists too. We'll talk about them another day. <laughs> That's a whole nother mess. Uh, if this is your first jumping spider, I would highly recommend that you start out with a native species, meaning uh, one that we have here in the U.S., which is not the high list. You need to start out with uh, one of our fed friends, which is gonna gonna be the regals, the Audix, uh, the Carneas are just. I recommend them because they are so friendly. Um, a lot of times I've noticed, um, sometimes the Audix, a lot of the Regals, uh, I think because your your skin is so warm, they they almost have this like little knee jerk reaction when they when you go to handle them. Um, they'll step onto your skin and just be like, ah, the floor is lava. Um, the Carneus. Uh, I'm trying to think if I've even had one Carneus that I've had interactions with that has had that uh, that kind of knee-jerk reaction to human skin, uh, to being handled, to being just even on it. Uh, so they are also very incurious and inquisitive, and like when you open their container, they don't run and hide. Um, <clears throat> they're very easy to take care of because they live out in the desert. Uh, they don't have as high needs for humidity. Uh, they're very colorful, uh, you know, but I understand I love Lucas too, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working uh, on, on more of the Regis, so I would, I would definitely stick with that, uh, maybe in a, a, a Odiosis, the, the gray ones, um, find something uh, that's native here to North America, maybe even to the region where you live, because if they already live where you live, it's going to be much less work for you to keep their natural environment for them. So you're not having to like recreate something like I'm having to do with these hylas because uh, they live in a jungle and I live in Kentucky. Very different <laughs> ecosystems. So um, most people um, that just want an easy pet aren't necessarily wanting to get into that deep. Um, definitely, you know, there's a reason that certain species are popular. Um, so I would recommend to do, you know, kind of doing your research a little bit. Obviously, most of you are in the Facebook groups. Um, I will talk endlessly about spiders uh, for 
for everyone anytime. Um, unfortunately, I don't I don't have that much time uh, to email, so I'm hoping or text. Uh, I know a lot of you <laughs> message with me, but just so you know, I uh, I hate texting. It makes my thumbs hurt, and I'm often busy uh, in here feeding and watering things. Um, so, uh, I think that covers pretty much most everything I think you would really need to know uh, to get started. Um, it's really hard uh, when you're in so deep <laughs> uh, to, for, for me to know what other people may not already know. Um, obviously, there's the spiders uh, and the mantids which uh, I'm hoping to be able to offer those soon. Um, I've been working really hard uh, to breed some ghost mantids. Um, I've also got a variety of lizards, like a chameleon and some geckos. Uh, so uh, I take care of a, of a lot of <laughs> exotic animals, but you don't have to be at that level uh, for a jumping spider. I feel like if you could take care of you know, a moderately need, need house plant or a fish. If you can take care of a fish, you can absolutely take care of a jumping spider. I believe in you. Um, you know, a little a little bit goes a long way. Hi, Ten. Nice to meet you. Um, so I, I'm just kind of wrapping things up here before I, I ramble on too much. If you can take care of a fish, you can take care of a jumping spider. Um, <laughs> It's, it's about uh, maybe not even that difficult because you don't have to test your water or, or do any of that. So um, definitely let me know if you have any questions. Uh, I might try and start doing these uh, videos on different care uh, or maybe different species. There's really not that much information on keeping jumping spiders out there. Uh, not like the tarantula community where people have been doing it 30 years. Uh, this is a relatively new hobby. Uh, I'm not claiming to know everything. Uh, obviously, every day I strive uh, to learn more and be better um, at this. Um, so, uh, you know, as I grow <laughs> uh, uh, as a spider enthusiast, I'm happy to share this information. Um, I have just a huge passion for insects and uh, spiders in particular uh, are arachnid friends that are so uh, misunderstood. Uh, I am out to change heart, hearts and minds on spiders and I thank you all for joining me in my quest and I am going to go work on all your orders. I'll talk to you soon.